Hello everybody and welcome back to MGMT 203 Project Management, a managerial approach. So uh, here we go. To this week, week two, we're going to be covering chapters four and five. Then we're going to slow down a little bit, but these are important chapters. Last week's work and this week to get you ready for part one of the Panama Canal uh, exercise that we'll be writing in next week. So we'll start out this week by talking about conflict and negotiation, right? So conflict, something many of us may already have experienced, is a process, it begins when one party perceives the other party has frustrated some concern of theirs, right? And our goal in with these conflicts when they occur is that um, to understand them and to negotiate or work through a path. Well, who are these conflicts with? Well, one of the things we wanted to do, and I mentioned it last week a couple of times, was to define a stakeholder. What is a stakeholder? What is stakeholder identification? We ask those kind of questions. And so a stakeholder is in the process of identifying them, is identifying that individual group or organization who may affect be affected by or perceive itself affected by a decision, activity, or outcome of a project. And then analyzing and documenting the key information, the relevant information about their interests, involvement, and influences on project success. That's a lot. Frankly, it's identifying anyone affected uh, by the project and analyzing their information regarding your project success. Just to simplify it, it's a good definition if you wanted to use that as you assess stakeholders in the Panama Canal exercise. This would be a sample stakeholder register. You could add to it, subtract to it, but notice you have the stakeholder's name, where they work, uh, what are their interests, needs, expectations on your project, right? If they're negative, you can move them to the positive. If they're positive, you can leverage that for ideas. In all of them, you may want to use them in your interview process to collect requirements, constraints, assumptions, uh, quality standards, risks, etc. So we identify stakeholders, uh, that ha and this helps us understand the environment we work in. It reveals the stakeholders' interests, especially key stakeholders, which I define in addition to the previous stakeholder definition as key as decision makers. A key stakeholder is a decision maker who's an individual group or organization that is affected by or may affect the success of your project, right? And so uh, we look for these potential conflicts with our projects so that we can eliminate them. And we want to leverage the relationships. And really, it's all about building trust. Okay. So if I'm going to interview stakeholders, these are some of the questions I might ask. I throw them out there just for your information only. You may read through these and go, ah, good list. I could build from this or I can use some of these in my own stakeholder interview questions. Well, one of the reasons I do stakeholder interviews, uh, is we just said was to assess their level of interest and involvement. And then we want to define key stakeholders and engage them right? And uh, so stakeholders have in this engagement process various levels. They're unaware, maybe they're resistant, neutral, supportive, or even leading, right? And so I, I given you an example. This list could be much longer. It's just a couple of stakeholders on the left, not by name, though when I did this originally I used names. Uh, and then off the t across the top are these levels I just mentioned. And CE is their current state, and DE is the desired engagement state. And so not everybody needs to be moved to the right. Not everybody has to be supporting or leading. Sometimes you just want them uh, in the neutral portion, right, to move them from current resisting, uh, like the FM, the finance manager, to neutral, stop talking bad about the project, right? Understand what their concerns are. And that's how I would use this stakeholder engagement type chart. Okay, so then uh, we're, and we're doing this because we have identified 
as previously noted, and then analyze the stakeholders, right? Uh, and we, uh, I do a lot of these. The one thing I would add to identify stakeholders here is um, I do it through interviews. So one of the last questions I ask on any interview is what other stakeholders do you believe I should go talk to, right? And it, it leads me to a new analysis, maybe somebody or some group I hadn't thought of. And then I'm going to go forward with this information and with my team, and I'm going to analyze the stakeholders, right? I'm going to update that register that I just showed you, which is a list of the stakeholders and some information about them. And then I'm going to build an approach to analyze them. Now, before I do, there are some stakeholders right off the bat that we want to be aware of. The project sponsor, which in, in the various process groups, initiating, planning, executing, MNC is monitor and control. And closing, you can see the project sponsor who basically owns the money, right? Uh, if funding your project. The project sponsor is going to be in have a role in all of the phases of the project. But then the team has a role too as defined here for like, for example, to help you plan to create your scope statement and your work breakdown structure from there by decomposing the scope statement, right? They're going to help enforce the ground rules that the team has set up and agreed to work by, etc. You are not doing all the work yourself is my point. You have a team to do it, ideally. So uh, we want to be aware of the functional manager, right? This is basically if the sponsor owns the budget, largely, uh, for your project, the functional manager generally owns the resources, right? You're going to need principal technologists or engineers or other specialties, and you normally will go to a functional manager. Now, there is then some uh, friction created between the functional manager and a project manager. And we'll talk about that later today when we talk about the various organizational types a functional organization, a projectized organization, a matrix organization, etc. Uh, but there's more in this slide you can read for yourself and in the uh, literature, of course. And then the project manager themselves, right? Your role is to meet the objectives. You're the one person really in charge. On, uh, and you pick, hopefully, your project management team, though some people will talk about it. Uh, will be assigned to you, right? Uh, you are not normally a technical expert, but you have some expertise in something. But you're a generalist who uh, applies these project management tools uh, throughout all of the knowledge areas. And we've talked about those before. Um, scope, schedule, cost, uh, quality, resource management, communication, stakeholder management, risk management, procurement management. I really believe I uh, covered it. Uh, and um, you're the only one with the knowledge of all that on your project that can integrate. Of course, you're, you will be referring back to the sponsor and addressing issues and escalating as you need to. Now, uh, a couple other roles is the portfolio manager, if your company has one, or a project manager. And we did discuss those last week a little bit. Right? You may work for a, pro a program manager, for example, uh, and if that's so, then they are related projects, right? So you want to, frankly, have a relationship with the other project managers around you related to that program manager. Now, we talked about stakeholder analysis, and one way to, so once I've collected all this information on the stakeholders, I want to analyze the stakeholders. And one way we can do that is with a power and interest grid. Notice the power on the uh, left vertical and on the horizontal is interest and and stakeholders generally fall into one of four categories bottom left I'm going to just monitor them if they have low power and low interest in the project but if they have high power and low interest I'm going to work to keep them satisfied so it's important to know the stakeholders needs what are the needs of the stakeholders if they have high power and are very interested in the project I am going to closely uh, manage them with updates and engagement, etc. And otherwise, I'm going to keep them informed. Now, here's another look at the same. I, I use this for two reasons. One, because 
notice that power goes by other terms like authority and interest goes by other terms like concern. So those are really synonymous interchangeable terms when talking this grid. Also, I wanted to show you another way of, of assessing or analyzing the stakeholders is called the salience model on the right. It's completely separate, but similar. And there you assess stakeholders based on their power or leg and legitimacy and urgency, right? And where they triangulate, it's like a Venn diagram. That's really, those are the people that you really want to be most concerned with and to manage. Uh, a third model often talked about nowadays is the cube model, which you can find uh, online pretty easily. So uh, we, we already mentioned stakeholder engagement, moving them from a current uh, position to a desired engagement. And their current might be your desired engagement. Not everybody, I said, has to be supporting, right? But we want to know what it is because so, it will drive then our communications plan, drives how we communicate with them, right? And it proactively gets ahead of issues so that we can uh, resolve things in a timely manner. Now, project managers then assess and address stakeholders throughout the entire life cycle. It's not a once and done. When you study project management, it's a process. But in reality, it's through it's it's that's called an iterative process, meaning you will repeat that process over and over and over and over throughout the life cycle of the project. And of course, while engagement engaging stakeholders we can expect conflict. Conflict is just life, right? We try to avoid it, but it's going to happen anyhow. So you know what? Let's make it an opportunity, right? So there are categories of conflict that we'll talk about. Um, largely, it's about goals versus expectations, uncertainties about authority, and even interpersonal conflicts can be one of them. Now, before I get into the engagement, we should talk power, right? A project manager is form of power, right? There's formal power, right? Based on the position, reward power, which is really the best. And I give you some examples. Uh, penalty power is the worst form of power. And both reward and penalty power largely come from this formal or legitimate power. There's also an expert power, like a subject matter expert, uh, referent power, which comes from another person liking you or respecting you, right? Maybe you like Seinfeld and you have some ref, he yeah, would have some referent power. Maybe you admire Patton, even if you didn't like him. Maybe you admire Patton, right? There's a referent power there. And of course, information, informational and financial power too. Now, uh, as it, we discuss stakeholders, so it comes down to then conflict management, right? Conflict management is largely done by the team, right? So conflict is inevitable. So turn it into an opportunity. First, even though it's inevitable, you want to try and avoid it, right? You want to set ground rules. You want to plan communications with the team. You want to follow good project management practices um, like listening and face-to-face -face communications and clear roles and responsibilities are essential. But conflict is going to happen. In fact, um, studies have shown these seven sources of conflict to include schedules, priorities, resources, technical opinions, administrative costs, uh, procedures, costs, and then personality. I frankly would have guessed personality would have been much higher, but it isn't. By studies, it's number seven, but it's still there. Notice uh, several of them are listed in the PMBOK guide. Uh, itself. So it is aware uh, that this happens. Now, when you have a conflict, it's best resolved by those involved, right? That's my Johnny Cochran moment, right? Uh, except when you have proof. So it's best resolved by those involved. So um, you don't necessarily as a project manager need to get into every conflict. And I know plenty of people that do that for a living, it seems like. Uh, best resolved by those involved. If the project objectives are not being uh, threatened, let people work things out, monitor the situation. Okay, we'll come back with tools uh, for conflict management in the next portion.